following is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. Tonight, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to actually ask a series of questions to Ted, and then we will have time afterwards for the uh, Q&A from the members. Uh, I will say a little bit, of, we're going to talk about his background in education. And, and most of you probably know, of course, that Ted Savas is the managing uh, director of Savas Beatty, which is the leading, a leading independent uh, trade publisher, which is headquartered in, in El Dorado, California, El Dorado Hills, California. And they published, uh, this company has published more than 100 military, general history, and sports history uh, titles many of which have been, of course, groundbreaking and award-winning and selected by the nation's uh, book clubs. Uh, the company's tagline is actually independent, scholarly, and a bit old-fashioned. So uh, let me start off. Uh, and we've, uh, as I just had alluded to earlier, we've had several speakers uh, who have uh, Sabbath Beatty books. And uh, I saw Ted uh, with Mike Mov being interviewed by Mike Movius on his uh, uh, Civil War Roundtable Congress and thought he would be a great speaker for us. To start things off, uh, Ted, please tell us about your educational background, like where you're from, how you ended up as a lawyer, we won't hold that against you, and then as a publisher. <laughs> I was born in North Iowa, just, uh, just below the Minnesota border and stayed there through law school, went to the University of Iowa, uh, filled my car with, uh, with my uh, gear, drove out to California, took the California bar, passed it, and started practicing law in Silicon Valley in 1986. I'd clerked out here in 1985, so it was pretty exciting to be an Iowa kid in the 80s out in California, it was, it was pretty neat. And then uh, I practiced law for a long time, I'm, I'm still licensed, uh, I practiced for about 15 years. Uh, I started a writing articles and things and then started a publishing company completely by accident. And it just sort of started snowballing and pretty soon I had a, had a law practice in one suite and a, and a, uh, and a publishing office in, in the next door suite. And our second kid came along and my wife said, you know, you need to cut down to about 50, 60 hours a week from a hundred. And I sold my law practice and started publishing full time. Uh, and that's uh, sort of how we, how we got into this. And I've been doing it. Uh, I sold my first company in 2000 or 2001 to Perseus Books Group uh, and combined publishing. It was a joint deal. Uh, coached Little League for three years, ghost wrote books, agented books, uh, got fat sitting at home and started Savas Beatty in 2004. And I just wanted to say we've published almost 400 books now, not, not 100. Great. And yeah, my son and daughter in law are actually lawyers. I'm oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I just well, talked my son. I absolutely just talked my son out of law school. I'm so <laughs> happy. They actually met in law school. Okay. Let, let's ask you another question. Do you have any publishing mentors or like people who helped you along the way? <laughs> you do. Yeah, we started something. I don't know if any of you remember it. It was called Civil War Regiments. That's how we got into publishing. A friend of mine, Dave Woodbury, and I, we started Civil War Regiments, a quarterly journal back, boy, maybe 1990 or so. And uh, we had, I think, one or two copies out. And Tom Broadfoot uh, became a friend and a mentor. And he gave us some of his table at the Fairfax Book Show. And we introduced, introduced us to people. And and that's kind of how we started. And Tom, uh, Tom and I would go fishing uh, off North Carolina, and he, you know, advised me all about the publishing world and what to do and what not to do. And, uh, and then I became good friends with Bob Younger, Morningside Books, sweet old Bob, as we used to call him, S.O.B. Bob. And uh, he was a good friend of mine for a long time, too, until he passed. And they both were really extremely helpful in, in helping me get started and, and guiding me. Okay. 
Um, we know that uh, Savas Beatty is the company name, and you're Savas, obviously, but who's Beatty? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting story. Uh, <laughs> Cap Beatty, Russell Beatty, called him Cap because he was a captain in the Korean War. I accepted his two-volume work on the Army of the Potomac, which is really good. Uh, and he was an SEC lawyer on Fifth Avenue in, in, in New York and, and spent 20 years going to archives and researching and that sort of thing. Great writer. And when I sold my company in 2000, I hadn't published his books yet. And they went to Perseus Books Group and we stayed in touch. We had never met in person. I don't meet most of my authors, which is, you know, one of the real downsides of where I live out, out, on, the, out on the wrong coast, I think. I don't know how I got here for 35 years. I should have been back, back there. But, um, but uh, so we stayed in touch and he, the books got published with Perseus, the first two volumes, and he wasn't real happy with a lot of things. And then he finally said to me that he really wanted to pull me back into the publishing world. And I told him I was really happy doing what I was doing. I didn't want to go back to it. Um, and uh, so he flew out here and, and we, were, we spent a couple days together. Again, I had never met him. And he uh, made me an offer I really couldn't refuse. And so we became Savas Beatty and started uh, January 1st of 2004. So he's the Beatty part. Great. Okay, so you're often called an independent publisher. What is that exactly? And are you a traditional publisher? Yeah, we're, we're a traditional publisher. Independent publishers sort of gotten merged into sort of like Xerox means a copy now. Independent publishing means basically we're not affiliated with a big group. We're not affiliated with a university. We're not affiliated with a museum. We stand on our own. And that's exactly what it is. We're a traditional independent publisher. Uh, and we are obviously we play in a niche. <clears throat> and I knew if I wanted to get back into publishing, which was very different then in 2004, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to do what I knew best, which was the Civil War and military history. And I wanted to play only pretty much in that pond because I wanted, I wanted to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond than try to be a small fish in a gigantic pond because we'd be eaten up. And so uh, we are an independent press, completely traditional, and we are primarily military history. So who, who submits the manuscripts to you? Well, we get an amazing amount of manuscripts. They, come, they still come in the mail, even though we don't ask for them in the mail. We ask you not to send them in the mail. They come primarily through our submission guidelines on our website. And one of the things I really take great pride in is publishing things that most publishers would not touch. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I taught high school for a year and, and I taught college for 20 years at night. I taught law and, and history and business. And I really enjoy teaching and helping because people helped me. And so I love passing that along. And so we get a lot of manuscripts in, and, and I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we get a lot of manuscripts in from people who may be terrific researchers, but not really great writers, or tremendous writers. It's amazing writing, but they're not great researchers. Bob Crick Sr., Robert Crick, who most of you probably know, he's been a good mentor friend over the years. And he told me when I was gonna start in the publishing business a long time ago before that, this is 90, he said, Theo, he said, you're going to meet two kinds of writers, those who can write but can't research and those who can research but can't write, and never the two shall meet, or rarely the two shall meet. He's right. It's very hard to find both. You find a few, but not too often. So a lot of these people would get rejected or do get rejected at other presses. Uh, and what I try to do, if I see good research or I see something really fresh and original, and an author, I think that we click, we have good chemistry together and, and that author's patient and sort of understands it, it takes a while to develop something. I'll work with them and try to get them up to the point of where we can accept their manuscript. And I bet we've done 50 people like that, that have ended up being published. And that way they learn and then they can go on and publish more. So I think that's probably a long answer to what you're asking. But no yeah. So, so how do you attract uh, new authors? We don't really shop for manuscripts much because we get two or three a day. And when you realize we do maybe 25 books a year, uh, you know, we get uh, 500 submissions a year. 
it's, uh, it's, it, it's pretty overwhelming. A lot of the people who submit really never even look at our website because they're submitting romance fiction or they're submitting uh, how to grow roses, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and so, but, but we get a lot of stuff that, uh, that's in our, in our wheelhouse. So we don't shop a lot to look for authors. However, we do craft certain projects. So I will go to certain authors and say, hey, I've got this idea. And we'll develop an idea and then turn that into a book. So we do do that. And so, therefore, what, what do you do to ensure that the authors that you do attract um, have talent and temperament to end up being successful? Yeah, I sort of got ahead of myself and ans answered some of that. I, I, let, yeah. me say this, let me say this about that. If you're an author, the whole submissions process is a filtering system. And most people who submit books do not understand that. In other words, we... We specifically, each, each press has its own submission guidelines. Follow them exactly. I mean exactly. Because A, it's the way that they operate. Their logistics system, it's set up a certain way so that it works for that press. But the other thing is, is that if you don't follow the rules when you're trying to get published, it's a really good indication you're going to be uncooperative and difficult when you're, when you're accepted to be published. And so... There's a whole string of things we ask you to do, and, and, and we'll get authors who say, you know, Mr. Savas, here, here's my manuscript. I know you asked me not to send it, but I attached it, and it doesn't have the bibliography, even though you asked for the bibliography because, you know, my wife read it, and she says it's fabulous, and I need you to publish it. Well, you're not going to get published that way. So if you're an author, and Blake, I'm talking to you. I know because you're writing make sure whoever you're going to try to submit it to that you follow their guidelines exactly because the whole process is whittling down to find the right title and the right author. So, um, and this dovetails into that. So what actually uh, do you do with the uh, freshly submitted manuscript? <clears throat> when one comes in, um, I usually will, will take every two weeks or so and I'll, and I'll go to the office usually on a weekend and I'll go through all the manuscripts and I'll start looking at the ideas. And we, we ask people not to submit manuscripts at first. We, we get the idea and we get a few other things. And then if we like that, we'll submit back and say, go ahead and submit the manuscript or a few chapters. And then I'll look through them and I can tell within two minutes, three minutes, whether it's something we, we could work with, whether it's something we want, whether it's something we could develop into what we want. Uh, and then we, if it, if it is, then we, we talk to the author and email back and sort of develop that relationship because it's all a relationship. I mean, that's, yes, he's an author, she's an author, I'm a publisher, but it's a relationship. And so, and then it becomes a partnership. And so we talk to them and develop them and, and see if we can work together and get that, get that going. Then what we do is we, we set it aside, we get all the parts we need and we sort of set it aside and we wait for the right editor because we have four or five different editors that we like to use. We assign the right editor to the manuscript and get the guidelines to the author and then off they go and, and they develop it and get it back to us on a publishing schedule. So, so how amenable are your authors to the editors? I imagine that varies from, from author to author, but uh, in general, uh, how, how well do they uh, accept the uh, suggestions of the editors? <laughs> yeah, I would say <laughs> pretty well, right? Um, because I have editors that are, that, you know, I've called through editors because you get different kinds of editors and some, uh, you know, just don't work well with authors and authors are a very sensitive bunch. Uh, I'm an author, I understand. I don't like it when people although I do now, I didn't used to like it when people would edit my work and tell me everything that was wrong and red line something, you know, early on, it's, it's sort of heartbreaking. <laughs> and then later on, it becomes something that you welcome. So it just depends sort of where you are in the process. Um, most of them are pretty good. Uh, I tell the authors and the editors, I don't need to be copied on every email and just let me know if there's a problem. And every once in a while, you know, you'll get a problem author who doesn't want to make changes uh, and if the changes really truly need to be made, uh, then I give my uh, editors carte blanche to just make the changes uh, because we reserve that in the contract because 
it's our name on the book. It's our money that we're spending. Uh, and you need to trust the publisher you go with as your partners. So we try to do everything we can to, to accommodate an author's wishes. And sometimes, mostly you can, sometimes you can't, and then you got to pull rank. And I, I don't like doing that. I think the next question also is going to vary from author to author, but you know, we all read lots of civil war books and some of them are pretty well written. Some of them are really brilliantly written, but for the most part, how do the books that we end up reading, how those manuscripts different from the manuscript that was initially submitted to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this will shock a lot of people. I think a lot of people don't, don't know this. I, it really hit me strongly back in, um, back in the early 90s. I was with uh, Clive Cussler, who became a pretty good friend of mine over the years. He just died recently. He's the, he writes the Dirk Pitt novels, and he wrote the Dirk Pitt novels. Real successful author, must have sold 100 million copies. And, he, and I found out that he because he sent me something that he had, had written and it was an original couple pages of something that he told me he was going to do. It was for one of his books and it was in his next book, but it was nothing like he wrote in his next book. And it was not well written. I mean, I was kind of shocked at how poorly written it was. And he admits to me, he writes all the stuff, you know, the plot and that sort of thing. He's a great plotter. And, and then he had really, really good editors who sort of rewrote it. Uh, and then I met one of those editors who rewrote it. And that was not uncommon. And it's not uncommon today. And so very often you get authors, like I said, who are really terrific researchers. And what we do is we give them a style sheet. It's very detailed. It's about 18 pages long. And we tell them, take your manuscript and match the style guide. Do the best you can. Be consistent. And then they do it. And then the, the editor goes with through it and let's say edits half of the first chapter. This is the way we do it. I don't, I don't know how other presses do it. And then I tell the editor, go back to the author and point out the major things that the author could do all the way through the manuscript. Passive voice, <clears throat> wrong clausing, uh, incorrect citing of footnotes, uh, not ranks aren't presented correctly, those sorts of things. And have the author do those. And then the author does as much as the author can do and sends it back. Well, at that point in time, the editor is going to have a real good feeling for how far the author can go. And at that point in time, once the author can do everything the author can possibly do, the editor rewrites it. And sometimes you're rewriting very little because you have some tremendous authors, just tremendous. And sometimes you're rewriting a lot. I mean, every sentence. But the research is fabulous. So it just depends on the author and depends on the book, but there's always a certain amount of work done and it just varies author to author. Okay, so um, here's something that a lot of people <coughs> may not even think about. Uh, so making a book attractive uh, to buyers obviously goes beyond the subject. Uh, what does the interior design and cover artwork uh, have to do with it? Essentially, why do these books look the way they do? And what input does the author have in that process? And also, is that now these days with eBooks less important in your thinking than it used to be? <laughs> yeah, good, question. good questions. We, um, one of the reasons I got into publishing was because I, A, I was tired of reading the same thing over and over. And B, I didn't like the way books looked. And so I knew what I really wanted and I really wanted to try to try to reach that goal of, of an attractive book that's, you know, well done and well researched. I liked footnotes at the bottom of the page and they're more expensive and they're more time consuming to lay out, but they're so much more convenient to the readers. And I didn't like the end, you know, the end notes uh, at the end of the book or at the end of, you know, end of the chapter. I just didn't like that. Um, there weren't a lot of maps. The font wasn't quite right. The, the letting wasn't quite right. The margins weren't quite right. In my opinion, it's, it's very subjective. Obviously everybody's different but I knew what I sort of wanted. So when I got into publishing, I completely learned how to do everything. I learned how to use software. I learned how to draw maps. I learned how to design stuff. The reason is, well, I'll, actually I'll, I'll tell you that, that story too. I'm a Greek guy. And so when you're Greek, 
it means you had a grandfather who ran a restaurant. And, and of course, he did. He ran two. And so I used to go into the restaurant and, and sweep and clean and do the things I used to do on the weekends when I was about 12 or 13. And then he would give me a hamburger. And, and when mom wasn't around, he'd give me a beer. And we'd you know, talk <laughs> about life. And one time I saw grandpa cleaning the bathrooms. And I said, grandpa, what are you cleaning the bathrooms for? He says, well, you know, I, it, they have to be cleaned. And then I saw him cleaning the grill. And I'm like, what are you cleaning the grill for? He says, well, they got to be cleaned. So then I saw him, you know, he's counting the liquor bottles and whatever. And I said, why are you doing all that? Why don't you, I thought your people, you had people do that. He says, listen, you can't run a business unless you know how to do everything because then you, you know what it costs, what it's worth, whether somebody's doing it right. And, and if they can't do it, you can do it. Well, that was his you know, philosophy. And in many ways that works. So I decided to learn how to do as much as I possibly could. Once I got the design I liked of a book, you know, I laid out maybe 15 or 20 different templates and we use those today. And so I might assign a book to production and I'll say use template C, but I want you to change X on, on template C so it looks a little like this. So then I know what the interior is gonna look like and it sort of matches the type of book it is. When it comes to covers, we use primarily a fellow in Iowa and we use a guy in, in, in uh, England. And we give them, we give the authors uh, the, you know, tell us what photos you want, tell us what kind of artwork you want. Do you have an idea of how you want the cover to look? And then we send that general work, artwork and things to the designer and the designer will give us three or four covers back and they're pretty different. And then the marketing director and I sit and we go through it and we try to figure out what direction we want to go. And when we figure out what we think is the best direction, then we pull the author in. And we say, here's, here's where we're going with this. What do you think? And then the authors give us their feedback because we want the authors to be really happy with the finished product because they've got years of their life in this. And we want them to be part of the process. We also send them a chapter of the, of the, of the design book. We say, this is how it will look inside. Do you like it? And mostly they love it. Sometimes they'll have objections and we, we work as hard as we can to honor their objections. I've got a little, little quick side note here. Um, I won't name the author. You would know him. Um, he hasn't published with us, but I remember this story from 20 years ago. He published with a press. I think it was, it was a university press and he had worked for three or four years on a very important book. And he sent the manuscript off and they edited the manuscript. He was very happy with the edits. And then the next thing he knew, he got a case of books on his doorstep. So it went from the edits good, it's done to product to, to finished book. He had never seen the inside. He had never seen the cover. He told me he opened the book up, um, almost vomited when he looked at the cover. <laughs> on the ins I'm not guessing. I'm, it's a quote. I'm not making that up. Uh, he opened up the inside, had the same reaction, didn't thumb through the book other than a couple of pages, took the book, put it on his shelf, and never opened it again. And I swore to God, it, it's an awful looking book. I mean, I'm, I've got a copy. It's terrible. I swear, I would never do that to an author. Ever, ever, ever would I do that to an author. So when an author gets the finished book, they've seen and they've approved the dust jacket, they've seen and they've approved the inside, they've seen and they've approved the editing, and there's no surprises. Okay, so, so the next question, I think a lot of people who read Civil War books would be interested in because, and some people are really map people, you know. So we, we often hear, uh, and I, I know Hal Jasperson, but we, we often hear critic criticism of books for not having great maps. So you're known for have for being uh, willing to use a lot of maps. Uh, yes. Tell us about that. And do the manuscripts typically typically come with masks uh, maps in them or just map ideas? Well, the way <clears throat> 2020 is going, they might come with masks pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> the. Uh, the uh, maps are one of those things where another one of the reasons why I got into publishing. And I remember certain publishers telling me I could never do what I wanted to do. You could never have a lot of maps because it takes a lot of work to work with maps and you couldn't do footnotes. You couldn't do and couldn't do and couldn't do. And I'm the kind of guy, if you tell me I can't do it, then I'm going to go do it. It's like my wife saying, you'll never be able to clean the backyard in an hour. So then I have to go out and prove that I can clean it in an hour. It's her way of getting me to clean it. Um, we learned how to draft maps ourselves. Uh, Dave Woodbury and I, when we started, we actually got software and we, we, we learned how to do it. 
And then it was very hard to find people who could actually do maps back then. They were done by hand often. Uh, and they looked okay for the time. And then all of a sudden the electronic maps came along and they were significantly better. And so what we do with authors is we explain to them, you have to have uniform maps. They can't be all kinds of different maps from all kinds of different sources. And we set up deals with different cartographers so that they can hire maps done for a reasonable price. It used to be really expensive to get a map done. And today they're a fraction of what they used to cost. And we also are willing to put in a lot of maps. It takes space. It usually it lengthens a book. It might add a half a signature to the to the length, and that extends a lot of costs up and down the up and down the production line. But in there you go, there you go, Robert. Yep. And in the end, uh, maps help readers, and they they help sell books, and they help us understand what people are writing about. So we are in favor of maps. So what's the, what's the length of the, the process typically from uh, having a manuscript submitted to you to its being on the shelf and ready for sale? That really depends. Um, typically, if a manuscript comes in, well, let me back up. The publishing world, for those of you that aren't, don't know, it, it works on two seasons a year. The first season is January to June, and that's called the winters of the spring season. And then it's July to December, that's called the fall season. And so you work a season and a half or so ahead. So right now, what month is this? It's, August, it's October. The 38th month of the year, feels like. Um, so it's October. Our spring season is all locked down. Our fall season next year is all locked down except for one slot. So you have to work that far ahead. So today I accepted a manuscript. And so that book won't come out before the spring of 2022. And so you just can't get them up faster than that. Now, if you have the space in your catalog or the ability to handle it, you can stick it in there and get it out, you know, in a, in a handful of months if it's a really good book. But then it's not locked into the wholesale trade. In other words, you have to put it in the catalogs for your distributors because we're distributed by, you know, by a, a national distributor international distributor, and then they get it, the data to Amazon, data to Ingram, data to Bacon, Baker and Taylor, uh, you know, all their stores. And so it takes a long time for all that information to sort of get out there and get the orders in. And you have to work on 17 different schedules, literally 17 schedules. And then all of that has to be collated in production wise. It's very complex. And so you can't just run a book out immediately. It just doesn't work that way and do a good job if you're, you really want to sell the book. It's a disservice to the author to do that. Okay, so uh, do you, do you uh, allow your authors to sell their own books? How does it work out? Are there positives and negatives to having the authors sell their own books? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. In, in the early days when we started publishing, the authors typically didn't sell a lot of their own books. Um, and the books would sell for full retail and you could sell through your books and, and it, was, it was easier. Because there's so much fighting for our, our attention today and there's so many wholesalers and, and Ebays and Amazons driving publishers out of business, one of the things that is critical if you're an author is tell your publisher you will take books, go to talks, walk battlefields, whatever the topic is, and you'll sell them. Here's the reason why. There's two or three good reasons for this. One is it moves inventory for the publisher and it keeps the publishers afloat. It's a, it's a big deal if you've got really good authors. Number two, it's a really good way for the authors to make money. We have authors who make thousands of dollars a year selling their own books. They live at Gettysburg or they live you know, close by or they've got a great website and they give talks constantly and they're just natural salespeople. And they buy a book for 50% off and they sell it, you know, for full price. It's hundred percent profit. And I've been schooling authors for a long time. I get really mad at them sometimes. Well, mad's not, I don't get mad, but I get frustrated. Um, that they're, they're, they're businesses. They're a business. You don't need to incorporate your business. You, you just use your social security number. You're a business. You can write off your travel. You can write off your gas. You can write off your printer. You can write off part of your house. 
uh, you're a you're a business and you're a brand. And the third reason is is that people really like to meet authors, and they'd love to have them personalize and sign a book and talk to the author. It's a big deal. I mean, I I'm in the publishing business, so I do this every day. I love meeting the authors that I buy a book from and chatting with them about their process, what they did, get them to sign it. I still love it, and so. That's sort of a, of a successful triumvirate. It's very important for a lot of reasons. I, it's the, kind of the, we call that the three-legged stool of success. So there you go. Yeah, I know, I know Ron Kirkwood has sold a lot of his own books. Ron's really active, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we read these blurbs on the dust jackets, you know, and how does that come about? And do the people who review these books really read the whole book? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and I can tell you how, if you want to know the secret about that, there's a way to, the way to figure it out. Uh, just to answer your second question first, I mean, good reviewers, God love them. We love them. Uh, I think probably the best real reviewer that I know is uh, Drew Wagenhofer on Civil War Books and Authors. Uh, uh, Drew, man, when he does a review, he finds a comma out of place, he tells you. And he is good. He reads them. He thinks about them. Uh, if you see a review in a magazine, if you see a review in Civil War uh, news or wherever you see it, if you see them primarily talking about what the book is about, so it's a Gettysburg book and they spend three-fourths of the review telling you about the Battle of Gettysburg, and at the end they say, oh, this is just a great book. It's got maps. Everybody should own it. They didn't read it. They didn't read it, but they got a free copy. And so I usually call those reviewers out. I mean, I, I, I call them on the telephone and I say, you didn't review, you didn't review that book. And, uh, and then they finally, sometimes they admit you know, that they didn't because it's not doing anybody a good service, right? It's, it's just, it's not helping anyone. And so it's really important that reviewers read it. Some do, you can tell which ones do now. So now you, you, you got your, your spidey sense antennas up there. Um, your other question was the book review uh, blurbers. Right. Yeah, what we do is we'll send out a, the manuscript. It depends on the stage. We'll either send it out in Word, uh, locked as a PDF, or we'll send out the, the, the galley locked as a PDF, all formatted up. And we'll ask them, we'll say, hey, would you mind looking at this? Um, if you're interested in a particular part of it, read that part, look at the bibliography, read as much as you can until you feel comfortable giving us a blurb. And a lot of those guys will read the whole thing. And some of them are really amazing. And a lot of them will read uh, just enough so that they know what it is because they know the author. They'll look at the sources. They'll check some things. They'll have a particular interest that might be covered in a couple chapters. And then they'll give us, give us a blurb. And I can tell you, we've gotten blurbs that I know were from people who didn't read the book. And if I, if I sort through those and find those, I will not use them. I, I don't care what the blurb says. I just don't. Um, so we're real careful about that. And most of the guys that we ask to read the book and, and blurb, they've, they've done it. So, so how do you at Savas Beatty market your books and do the booksellers uh, help in the process? The booksellers used to help in the process. The booksellers are going out of business today. And it's yeah. really a shame. Borders used to be the best. Um, Borders had a really nice Civil War section. We would send authors there. They'd have a sign outside. They'll have a sign standing there. They'd have, you know, 15 chairs set up, uh, refreshments. They were fantastic. Uh, you'd walk into uh, uh, Barnes and Noble, and and sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes you'd walk in. I, I'd be with an author on part of a tour. Sometimes it's fun, and and they'd say, "Oh, was that tonight?" And there was no advertising. There was there are no nothing set up. It, it, it becomes a disaster. Um, but they don't have the money or the resources today because they've painted themselves into a corner, uh, and they've forgotten really how to sell books. They're more interested in selling donuts and coffee. And so it, it's a shame, really. I've, I, yeah, it's a shame. And so they don't really help that much. Uh, Barnes and Noble is really struggling. I don't expect that they'll be around at the end of next year. I think they'll be gone. <laughs> Yeah, it's the reality. So we've we've seen these these uh, big budget books, uh, big promotional budgets, things like Harry Potter. Um, are do you guys at Savas Beatty have pro promotional budgets for your books? Yeah, we do. It's really interesting. 
Um, it's interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to you. I, I hope this isn't too in the weeds for you, for you folks. I mean, I hope you're finding it interesting. I, I don't, I never really know. You, you really can't tell. Um, yeah. So when we publish a book, this is typically how publishers do it. This is how we do it for sure. And I've talked, I talked to a lot of different publishers in, in large and small, and they follow some rule like this. Here's what we do. So let's say we publish uh, 10 books in a season, let's say. And what we do is we release a book. We know ahead of time, basically, is it going to be a book club selection? <clears throat> is the author going to pick up 10 copies or 200 copies and go out and do X? Uh, does the author want to speak? Is he, he or she a good speaker? That sort of thing. And we sort of have an idea as to how, how the book's going to do. But what we do is we track it. We track it almost every day. And if, if a book goes out and it sells a certain number, it doesn't have to be a huge number. Civil War books typically don't sell huge numbers. But let's say it sells, and I'm completely making up these numbers, okay? Let's say it sells 500 copies, just making a number up. As soon as it hits a certain number within a certain time, it's like, it, well, to use a Civil War analogy, it's like an attack on a part of the line and you're breaking through the enemy's line. That's where you reinforce success. So you look at your books and you say, that one has sold 200 copies and the author is done doing talks because the author is lazy. He's not going to do that. And that author over there is working like mad and can't sell his book. Well, that's not good. But that book over there, the author's doing pretty well. The book has sold 500 copies. We're almost getting ready to reprint. And that's where we reinforce the line's been broken over there. And that's actually the terminology that we use in the office. Sarah will come in and say, oh, the line's broken over there. And then we'll look on it and we'll talk about it. And that's where you reinforce success. Now, what does that mean? That's where the money goes. So if we're going to do a tour, uh, that's where the money goes. If we're going to do ad more advertising, that's where the money goes. Because you want to reinforce success. You don't put money, good money after bad money. And so I always tell authors this. Well, let me give you, let me back up. I've been up since four this morning drinking about 15 cups of coffee. I'm a little, little uh, over exuberant. If you're in a big publishing house, this is absolutely true. I talked to one and they do like 250 titles a season. They put promotion in advance behind about 25 of those. That's it. The rest of them, they have zero dollars and they watch. What is the author going to do? Is the book going to pick up the word of mouth? Is it going to be like a virus and spread? And then they watch. And when a book, a big, big book, like a HarperCollins sort of book, when it hits about 7,500 copies, that's the one that gets money. And the other books, if they don't hit a certain number by a certain time, and this is most of the books, 80%, they go into the remainder bin 60 or 90 days later. So you work for three or four years on a book, you get a big press, you publish the book, you'll never hear from the press, they don't, they don't, they don't cooperate and communicate with you. Uh, and then they put your book out, you're really excited, and then 60 days later, it's at, it's at Walmart for $1.99. And that's what happens. And so if you're going to publish, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here too, uh, if you're gonna publish, do a couple things, and this is very important as an author. Make sure you understand the publisher you're going with, because every publisher satisfies a different need. Some publishers are library publishers. They publish for libraries. They're very high priced, so it means you really can't buy them and resell them because they're ridiculously priced. And they sell very small numbers, two or 300 copies, into libraries, and then they're done. Sometimes you have trade presses. Sometimes you have niche presses. There's different kinds of publishers. So make sure that you're with a publisher who is going to support the kind of book you want to publish and that you want to see. That's really important. So uh, we know the book world has changed since you began. It's still changing. And uh, so what we want to ask, is that good or bad? And dovetailing onto that one, do you prefer print or digital personally and why? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the printing world has changed so radically <clears throat> starting in the early 90s, right? No internet, big film tables, 
Uh, you couldn't even print a book out and get it printed. I mean, it was just, it was just ridiculous. I don't even know how anybody did it then. And today, of course, it's all digital. Everything's done over, you know, digitally. But the problem today is the internet creates opportunities and it creates pitfalls. Nobody likes Amazon. I mean, we hate Amazon and we <laughs> love Amazon. We have a love-hate relationship with that company. And, the, and we have a love-hate relationship with the way things are tracked through the system because digital tracking and modern day tracking is really hard because everything moves like this. And it's not a different schedule now. You used to work eight, 10 hours a day. Now you got to work 18 hour days sometimes when you get new books out because there's so much going on all the time. And so one of the things that's really important for authors and for publishers is you have to understand the speed at which things take place because they're very fast and they move out quickly. Let me give you one more example of that. We've had books that have are at the printer and the first run is sold out already. And that's because we haven't gotten an order from so-and-so or hadn't gotten an order. And all of a sudden the books at the printer, you've got your print run set and somebody will come in from England or from somewhere else and they'll want X copies and they want them by a certain date and everything is moves at lightning speed. I don't, I don't like that about the, about the, the publishing business. I, I, I don't, all businesses are like that today. Mostly I, I don't like that. Um, digital came about, we were two years ahead of the big boys in digital, which was really cool. We saw that wave coming, uh, studied it real carefully, got into it because we knew it was like toothpaste. You, you couldn't put it back in the tube. You couldn't go back. And digital so, sold really well and it climbed pretty fast. And then it leveled off about four years ago. And then it started going down and sales have gone down for a couple of years and now they've been level for two years. So they climbed up doubling every year. It was crazy. And then they peaked for about a year or two. Then they started tailing down. They fell about 40% and now they're level. And that's sort of where they've been for the last two years. I don't think that's really going to change much. Print is coming back into vogue, which is fabulous because I love, I'm a print guy. Uh, I'm a tactile guy. You asked me if I like print or digital. I'm a tactile guy. I like to crack a book open and smell it, and look at it and feel the paper and look at the binding and take the jacket off and look. Yeah, I, I'm just that kind of, that kind of guy. I'm a bibliophile. My wife reads digital. I mean, she's got her Kindle and that's what she reads. Once in a while, it's a print book. It's almost always Kindle. Here's something that shocks people. There are a lot of our customers who buy both. And a lot of authors think that digital cannibalizes print, but it really doesn't. Digital actually helps sell print. A, you get the digital market, they wouldn't have bought the print. That's some segment. If you have somebody who buys digital and they're talking about the books that they're reading, they're talking to people who are, some of whom are gonna buy print that wouldn't have heard about it, they buy print. There are the people who buy print, then there are the people who buy both. And so we have people who say, I'll, I'll buy a book and then I'll take the digital in the field or I'll keep the digital at home and I'll take the book in the field and, and, and write in the margins and, and, and take notes, which is, I think is kind of cool. I mean, I, I like that. I don't mind that at all. And so there are people who buy both. It's just a personal preference, uh, but I'm not afraid of digital. We love digital. And somebody asked, I guess, John, maybe it was you, whether books have changed on the inside with digital. I think you asked that earlier. We're doing something new with digital that we hadn't done in the past because we were stupid and didn't see the opportunity. And I mean, dumb, stupid. You can make, you can, you can't print color maps inside a black and white book separately because you have to have color sections at the printing sections. It's very expensive to print color, but you can have color maps in digital books. Hello. And digital books, digital maps that are in color are beautiful on a Kindle or a Nook or whatever. Right. So we've started talking to our map folks and saying, look, we want you to do the maps in black and white for the print, but we want you to start in color and design them in color. And then when the time comes, we'll grayscale them and, and, and take care of that problem. But we're going to put the color ones in the, in the digital. So now coming up this year, we're going to have a lot of digital books that are color on the inside with color maps. They're just beautiful. I looked a couple samples last week. They're really nice. You can't get an author to sign your Kindle either. So, um, so which books sell the best? <clears throat> the ones we publish. 
I saw a couple smiles there. I want to make sure you guys are still awake. It's like late on the east on the east coast. We're almost done. <laughs> um, the uh, battle books always sell, right? Battle books, tactical books, strategy—they always sell well. When I got into back into this game, I told myself I wasn't going to print publish Gettysburg because I was tired of Gettysburg. This is 16 years ago. And then I've ended up becoming sort of a dominant Gettysburg guy with books, but we had great stuff. Um, they just sell. People love it. And that's what they want to read. And, uh, and I, I get that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm understanding that. And, and I want to satisfy that mark. Okay. The, the, the last question before we open it up. Um, so why do you think you've been so successful uh, and uh, for so long and when a lot of people in the niche publishing uh, business fail? I think the best answer to that question is we try to do what we think our customers want and we listen to our customers. We get calls all the time and they want this, they want that, they'd love this different, they want a book on this and we really work hard to satisfy our customer base if you're on social media and you and you see Savas Beatty on social media, or you get our newsletter, I don't, how many get our newsletter? All of what you don't get our newsletter. <laughs> All right, that's it. Sign up for our newsletter on our website and look at one, just one, and you'll see what I'm talking about. We interact with people. We have fun doing what we're doing. We've personalized what we do. We've opened up our offices to people with short films and with pictures and people can call us and talk to us because that's how you should run a business, right? It's customer first, it's customer service first. And when you've got happy customers, you've got loyal customers and you go to bed at night happy about what you do. And that's what we've always tried to do. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let Let's open it up for questions. Uh, they, I assume right. in the chat, right? Yeah, yeah. let me go ahead and moderate those. And um, be, there are a lot of specific questions, but I wanted to start with the one that uh, John Ciccone raised at the beginning during our, during our social hour so we can get the, the heavy duty question um, answered uh, first, and then we can get into some of the uh, specific questions, and I have some too. John, do you want to take yourself off of mute and go ahead and ask your question? Go ahead. Well, with uh, organizations, uh, with the growth of the lost cause genre, organizations like the, the Southern Historical Society, um, they had a, an extraordinary impact on the way the Civil War, the memory of the war, and the meaning of the war was perceived in the South. I mean, it was almost as if there were two competing camps, Northern and Southern. And in the past, um, I guess, the two or three, maybe three or four, three decades, we've seen a more balanced discourse. Um, uh, we've seen books, for example, like uh, Confederates in the Attic or The Reappraisal of Grant. And uh, I was wondering uh, how, you've, how, how you've responded to this and how you've seen it. So is your question, is your question, how have books changed over the years? Are they better? Are they worse? Are they, is, is that your question? I'm not sure I understand it. I see a lot, I, I see a lot of Southerners and they will often talk about the war as the war of Northern aggression or something of that. <laughs> um, and you get a lot of, uh, there is still a percent. I remember there was a Texas um, official uh, a government official who said flat out the Civil War was not about slavery, it was all about states' rights. Those kinds of perceptions still exist in many parts of the South. And uh, do you see a, a broader trend now towards dispelling a lot of that stuff or readdressing the issues? I think it's sort of waning. It's not anything like it used to be. Um, but, you know, I think everybody comes at this, this, this defining moment in our history differently. And, you know, some people uh, come at it uh, just raised in a different kind of culture and, than others. It's really hard for me to, it's hard for me to say because I grew up in, in, in Iowa and there was like no talk about the Civil War of any kind in Iowa. And my relatives came over, you know, in the early 1900s uh, uh, from Greece. And so I, I didn't grow up in a family that had any relatives in the war. 
So it didn't, it didn't mean anything to me in that respect. So it's hard for me to, to sort of address that directly. We don't, what's interesting though, John, is we don't get, I, I bet in all the years I've published, maybe let's say the last 16 with, with Sabbath Beatty, I don't think I've ever seen a book come in uh, that's pushing a narrative like that. And I'm surprised because I know that they're out there. I mean, I mean, I see them being published. Maybe they don't think that it's something we would publish. It's probably not something we would publish. Um, but they're, I don't see them. Um, so they're, they're, skipping, they're skipping past us. I thought earlier when you asked this question, I thought, I, I guess I completely misunderstood it. I, I thought it was asking about the, like, the quality of Civil War books today and, and the state of Civil War writing today. And I wanted to say, it, it, maybe I'll repost it on Facebook or, or, or on our blog. If you go to our blog, savasbady.com, at the bottom of the page, there's a blog. There's a link at the top. And, and I'll repost this article. I wrote an article that the golden age of Civil War history is today. Hmm. And it's not 50 years ago. It's not 40 years ago. It's not Douglas Salfo Freeman's time or Catton's time. It's today. And the reason I say that is, is because if you look at the, the quality of source material that they did not have access to, if you look at the way things are footnoted today, if you look at the care that's taken to make sure quotes are correct, the modern, the, the golden age of civil war is right now. You and I are living through it. And, and if, you, if you doubt that, go back and pick up a book. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I love Cat and I love Freeman. I mean, I, I cut my teeth on these guys. All, most of us did. But if you go back and pick up a book on, uh, Nolan's Iron Brigade and Nolan, God rest his soul, was, was a good friend of mine. He, he wrote the, the first book in the Iron Brigade. Go back and compare that award-winning bestseller to Lance Hurtigan's book on the Iron Brigade. And Lance has 10 times more sources. The writing's smoother and better. The footnoting's better. And the book is better. It's because our expectations are higher. The maps are better. Uh, things are just better today. And, and we have a nostalgia for the older stuff to a certain degree, but I'm, and again, this is subjective. I completely understand that, but I have a complete 100% confidence that today we are lucky. We are living through the best Civil War stuff that's ever been published. All right. If you guys don't mind just saying, I've got a Brady bunch of dogs here and I've got Kenya the Pitbull who writes our newsletters. She's looking to get outside, and my door's right here. Let me just let her out. <laughs> okay. Uh, John, thanks for your question. Thank you for muting. I'm going to uh, conflate two questions here, one from Tom Boltz and one from Paula Whitaker that I think go together, and they segue nicely from John's question. Uh, Paula asked whether you're seeing any changes for Savas Beatty because of um, Black Lives Matter or other big changes in society. And uh, Tom asked, uh, Tom Boltz asked whether, if you're finding any authors that are writing topics that haven't been written about. And in some cases, the, those two questions um, are the flip side of, of sure. each other. So, uh, and Paula, if you want to amplify or Tom on those questions, go ahead. So the you know, first yeah, just changes in, you know, the kind of books you're publishing or how you're promoting them or, you know, just what's kind of sure. going on in, in your, you know, in, in the industry in regard to sure. yeah, you know, really and also good COVID. Yeah. Yeah, re 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 yeah, really good questions. Um, we have not, we have not really seen any kind of problems uh, as far as publishing Civil War material in this environment. If I did see some kind of problems, uh, it's a mixed crowd here of women and men, so I can't say exactly what I'd like to say because I wouldn't be considered a gentleman. Uh, I wouldn't care, and I'd continue doing what I know is good and right. Uh, I do. We get called names sometimes. It's kind of funny. Um, I'll be on Facebook and I'll promote a book that's got uh, maybe it's I don't know the, the Peach Orchard book or whatever, and somebody will say, "Well, you're just a racist for publishing that crap." This kind of stuff, and I just delete them and move on because. You know, I, I, whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't care what somebody says, but we don't really have any sort of problem that way. Uh, and I'm glad for that. As far as uh, the virus goes, the virus uh, is, 
the way it was handled and the way that it that it shut everything down and then the way a lot of it has stayed closed down uh, has collapsed a lot of businesses. Obviously, you all know that. It almost collapsed us and it almost collapsed. It's, it's collapsed a lot of publishers who will be out of business and I already know about 20 of them. They won't make it and they'll be gone next quarter. And a lot of them are small publishers, good publishers. They're, they're, they just, they're, they're bankrupt. They can't do it. I'm really thankful that when this stuff started at the end of January and, and at the very beginning of February, I called everybody together and I said, look, this might last for two weeks. This might last for two months. Uh, we're going to cut hours about 20% just to be on the safe side. You guys tell me what hours you want to work figured out. And we were a little bit ahead of the curve and it ended up where we cut hours 70%. And we've got two people who are at eight hours a month right now. They're, they run our accounts. All of our accounts outside the book trade are still closed. That's about 55% of our business. They're still closed. Our two biggest accounts outside the trade have told us they will not be ordering until after the first of the year. They told us that three months ago. They don't order in January, February. So I gathered everybody together and said, we will not have orders for eight months. What do we do? And we are really lucky that we had several books coming out that we published that had backing behind them, authors and history clubs and things. And then we did the Batchelder papers and that was extraordinarily successful and it's been fine. And we've now ridden through the wave. Uh, Amazon's been pretty good. Uh, some of the trade stuff's opening up again and the biggest, well, not the biggest, but a really big shot has been doing talks like this, and I've explained to people who ask these questions, and I say it this way, and I, and I, want, you to, I want you to take it like I mean it. I don't want you to, 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 to take it wrong. If you're gonna buy a mattress, save a few bucks. If you're gonna drink a craft brew from the corner craft brewery, or buy a craft book from a small publisher, if you can, buy it from the publisher, buy it from the brewery because it is so hard in today's marketplace to stay alive and stay afloat. Amazon's putting people out of business uh, right and left, and it's very hard. And so if you order, a lot of people would email us or call us even and say, I, I had no idea that you guys really don't make any money if we buy from Amazon. And I'm like, it barely covers costs. And the authors get screwed. The authors get nothing, basically. And so I tell them, you know, if you, if you support your publisher, you'll have this stuff forever. <clears throat> I have this conversation with my wife, you know, I'm 68, I, 62 and, and I, um, I, I'd like to retire and I did pretty well in the law practice. I've done okay in the publishing business. It's not litigation money, but we've done okay. We do okay. And I'd like to retire. I can't. And you know why I can't? Cause nobody's going to publish what I'm publishing. And it really kind of freaks me out at night. I get up at three in the morning. These are the things I think about when I'm letting the dog outside and I'm standing outside looking at the stars. I think who's going to publish these regimental histories and battle histories? Harper's not. Who's going to do it? They're, I don't know. And so, uh, you know, I, so I, I keep doing it and I love it. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, it's hard. And so if you can support your local publisher, if you can support your local crafts person who's doing whatever, support them directly. Amazon doesn't need the money, but they do. And the authors do. There have been literally thousands of books published on the Civil War. And how often do you run into something where you say, this is something new, kind of new territory that nobody's covered before, or maybe not in a really long time. And this is a topic that's really sparked people's interest, but maybe, I like say, new research. Sure. New topic, whatever. Sure. Fabulous question. And I know that you asked that earlier and it was at the end of Paul's and I'm sorry that I missed it. I want this to come across correctly too. I honestly truly believe in my heart because I, I search for these. The vast majority of what we do fits the, what you just described. We reject stuff over and over and over because it's been done to death and it's being done the same way. We won't do it. And so we really look, who was telling me about the, uh, the Ron Kirkwood book earlier on Spangler's Farm. I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> this is a guy that came to me with something that's completely fresh. It was the most, you know, yeah, there you go. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And I had never seen anything like it. I had no idea about what would happen there, the hospitals, how the land was used by the Union Army. It's got four pages on Armistead, uh, General Armistead wounded and, and how he might have died and 
doctors describing his wounds, all fresh stuff. Um, the Peach Orchard book by Hessler that we did. <laughs> the Peach Orchard. The Tullahoma book we just put out by Powell and, and Wittenberg. Nobody's done a book on Tullahoma. Uh, defending the Arteries of Rebellion. Nobody's done a Confederate perspective book on defending the rivers. So, Tom, to your, to your, to your point, we really try to craft books that are attacking something freshly, either completely or with new sources from a new direction. And so I, I, I think that the vast majority of what we do should be in that, in that vein and is in that vein. And that, that's a great question because I get tired of, you know, looking at other people's catalogs and some of our own from the past and saying, yeah, this has been done to death. Uh, you know, it's something fresh is really important. Well, and, and that's where I thought uh, Paula was going to when she referenced uh, Black Lives Matter. Do you have any books that are uh, looking at things that uh, nobody has looked at before? There's been a resurgence of uh, looking at uh, the U.S. Colored Troops, for example. Uh, we're going to have a speaker uh, next month. Um, do you have anybody coming in that wants to uh, look at things that were not looked at before, um, specifically with the African American um, population. We, yeah, I, I wish we did. Um, we don't. Yeah, there are very few that come in. We got one um, not too long ago, and I had to reject it. It was it was uh, not uh, black jackets. It was about black uh, sailors. But it was just, it was, it was too short for what, and we couldn't use it in our Emerging Civil War series, which is a shorter series. And there wasn't enough material to, to get it lengthened. And so he's gonna place it somewhere else. But it's a great topic and that would have been a neat topic to do. Uh, but yeah, there, there are very few, uh, very few books uh, or manuscripts that we see uh, on that topic. Uh, we have another question from, uh, about the uh, changes that you've seen since the uh, sesquicentennial. Yeah, you know. Uh, that's from Don Mack. I don't know if he's still on, but Don, if you're on, if you want to uh, follow up on that question. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've seen like a drop in demand for uh, media attention and uh, myself as a reenactor of uh, Civil War Cavalry. Uh, I said a lot of drop off on uh, reenactments, and part of that is kind of due to the sentiment as reenactors being associated with with Confederate monuments. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah I, I, but I was wondering, yes, from a book point of view, um, has there also been a drop off of interest in Civil War history? No, the interest is increasing. Um, I, I can't really speak to reenacting because I just, I, I, I've never been a reenactor and, I, and I, I'm out in California. So we reenact earthquakes out here and, and, uh, and fires. As far as a, 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 a Civil War interest goes, I can honestly tell you, and I feel really good about this, is that the interest is growing again and you know, we, we have some young ladies here, but most of us guys are getting older. And uh, <laughs> and it's really imperative that we bring in fresh blood because they're not getting this in school. I mean, let's just face it, they're not getting this in school. We, we created the Emerging Civil War series, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And one of the ways to get people in, shorter bike books, and it's really worked and that's been helping us and I think the interest. Uh, social media has helped but we're seeing an interest and at a younger age in people who are buying civil war books. And we keep track of our marketing data as closely as we can. Data is, is critically important. And so we track it very carefully. When people call, we get as much data as we can and chat with them. And sometimes we say, do you mind if we ask you how old you are? We're very curious. Most people are happy to tell you. And we're seeing a little bit of a younger age now. Um, which is really cool. Uh, sometimes we, people in their 20s and 30s are calling and they're discovering Civil War books and they're reading Killer Angels for the first time or they're reading Six Days <laughs> in September for the first time or something. And they, uh, they're calling and, and, and buying books. So I'm really optimistic, uh, very optimistic. Here's uh, one from Robert Plum. He wanted to uh, ask you if there are topics that are untapped 
uh, that you would you think uh, what Civil War topics are untapped for books? Uh, and, and Bob is an author, so. <laughs> when, when, it's kind of funny because when I think about that and talk about that, the, the, the average person who's not a Civil War person thinks, well, what more could you possibly write about the Civil War? And my answer is everything because so much hasn't been touched yet and so much of what has been done in the past isn't right. Uh, sources were used incorrectly, sources were ignored, sources weren't touched, the, the, the public in per perception of what's fact is completely wrong. Uh, so there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, if you want to talk about a few topics, well, uh, Trans-Mississippi, of course, is wide open. I mean, there is so <laughs> much that went on in the Trans-Mississippi. Uh, it, it, it's incredible. A lot of people aren't interested in it, but I think a lot of people aren't interested because they've never read anything really good from there. Uh, but it's the Civil War, and, and if you like the Civil War, it's it's pretty interesting. A lot of the naval stuff is still waiting to be to be uh, written about. I think there are many generals that have not had really good biographies that really need a good biography. Beauregard needs a good biography. Uh, I think Mead. I think my friend Kent Brown is finishing up his um, Kent Maston Brown is finishing up his biography on Mead. I know that's going to be a good book, and Mead is desperately in need of I think of a good biography. So there are there are plenty of people that that need them. There's a lot of units that are waiting to be written about. Um, yeah, I, I just think there's a lot of topics that are waiting, waiting to be discovered. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. We have a lot of authors who are working on some, and I'm excited to get them in. When you said uh, maybe there are new topics, but they're a new perspective on looking at an older topic or fresh research that brings uh, more insight to something that we hadn't seen before. So right. you know, I think that's a rich, uh, rich area. <laughs> If you guys want to, and I'm not trying to hawk the book, go, go, go get it at a library or, or I don't care, buy it off eBay for a dollar. There's a, there's a guy, Eric Wittenberg, one of my authors, sent me uh, Sam Hood six years ago or seven years ago, whenever it was. And he said, this guy's got something on his ancestors, like a collateral descendant of, of John Bell Hood. So I looked at it, and what really shocked me was he was explaining that Almost everything that was controversial about Hood that you believe to be completely true wasn't. And he said, I've got the, I've got the facts to prove it. And I said, well, yeah, you know, sure. Okay, fine. The moon's made out of cheese. And so he sends me his manuscript. And so I opened up the books because I have a real big library and I opened up at everything he wrote about. And I was, the hair was starting to rise on my neck. And the reason is, is because he was saying, here's what somebody wrote in book X 25 years ago. And then the next author wrote the same thing and added a couple words, cites the same source. Then the next author writes something else, adds two or three adjectives, cites the same source. Then you go back to the original source. The original source doesn't even say that. It says the opposite. Or it doesn't even talk about it. And so uh, it was one thing after another. His whole book is not a biography. It is how historians use and misuse sources. And by the, t we sold, I don't know, three or four printings of that book. It won a couple of awards. And I had, I can't tell you how many people emailed, faxed, called, uh, wrote letters and said, oh my God, I don't think I'll ever look at a history book the same way again. I start, I'm checking the sources now because it was, it's crazy how off they were or outright misleading or lying they were. And part of it is intentional, part of it is. The other part is laziness. You get so many authors who will write something from a secondary book and then they go quote the primary source that's cited in the secondary book. So they're relying on the first author to do the work. Well, I'm sorry, that's pathetic. It's just pathetic. If you're his threat, it's just wrong. And so every author, it's like, it's like all of us sitting in a group and I whisper to Kim a sentence and it goes all the way around to Paul and Paul tells me something and it doesn't have anything to do with the sentence that we talked about. That's what ends up happening. But we read it as readers. And as readers, we read that and we think it's true because everybody's reading it. It's got to be true, but it's not true. If you want a study about how historians operate and don't operate, read John Bell Hood by Sam Hood. It, it, will, it will 
graze the hair on your neck. The, we talked a lot about the Civil War, um, but how broad do you go in the Civil War? Um, I know one of your books, uh, looking at, at Lincoln and, and the structure of reason. I think, it varies from, I think it varies from press to press, quite honestly. Um, for Sabbath Beatty, the Civil War is literally 1861 to 1865, and it's primarily military. Uh, because that's the way we define it to sell our books. Uh, but of course, it's really broader than that, right? And so, <laughs> it, it, yeah, I mean, it's much broader than that. And so it's diplomacy and economics during the time, and it's the home front. I mean, it's, it's, it's all of that. Now, if you're asking me, does it encompass Lincoln books that are beyond his time in the Civil War? Like, like are you saying like Lincoln on the Prairie or something? Well, not like, just like it on the prairie, but I mean, something like a, I mean, like his life, part of it is, is the Civil War. Well, then I think you, if part of it's the Civil War, I think it's a Civil War book, because you might have a biography that talks about somebody's Mexican War service, right, as they, as they come up to the Civil War. So as long as I think the core thrust of the book is something that happened during the Civil War years, I would consider it a Civil War book. But again, other presses and it's it's how they market and how they how they play in that pond. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I answered your question, David. Yeah, that you did. It's good. Thank okay. you. Thanks, you guys. All right. Have Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.